So, we'll uh, put the criteria for stability, permission and instability uh, in a table. Currently stable means reading on point sites less than 10 percent sites which are less than 4 mm PPD sites and no BOP at 4 mm sites. Currently invention means that there is little more reading sites more than 10 percent but all other parameters are the same. And currently unstable means any pocket that is 5 mm or more and there are pockets that are 4 mm. Now stability or active disease. We, uh, the treating condition will be normal. If you have treated your patient well and the patient is maintained, there are no risk factors. And the patient comes for re-evaluation after three months of your active therapy case. You find one or two five millimeter signs. But that is not bleeding. You don't have to necessarily state that the disease is active. Even though the statement in the classification says that anything more than equal to five that bleeds or without bleeding. So it's a pure clinical judgment. But you are treating the patient, you are following the patient. Just by saying one or two sites that are still showing more than five millimeter of pockets, but it's not showing any other signs of activity, separation, bleeding, or uh, anything discomfort, you are not uh, state and So this is a caveat in the new classification system. Uh, it is purely based on the now the last part of the new classification, the pushing of prostate. This is a very sensible and very clinical thing. The, the crux of the new classification is, is basically purely based on the economics. Now the risk factors, we are considering the two most important risk factors which are modifiable, which are objectively, it can be measured in the baby. And this has got the maximum uh, evidence base, strong evidence base. You know that? Smoking is the second most important risk factor to their life. Odds ratio rating from 3 to 5 that means that any patient who is a smoker is 3 to 5 times riskier for the severe disease. And also the response to therapy will be also less in such patients. And we also know that, that smoking is a dose dependent factor. You more, smoke more cigarettes, you are more risky. So in patients who smoke 10 cigarettes, is considered less than 10 cigarettes, it is considered as having moderate risk. Those, those who smoke more than 10 cigarettes are considered as having severe risk. Similarly, diabetes, 6.5 percentage is PA1C, is the optimum factor. So, this should be the parent, this should be the biomarker for us to uh, diagnose their experience. You know, our experience. Look at the SPA1C, if it is 6.5 percent, it is optimum control, but the patient is having some risk. If it is more than 7, it is suboptimally controlled. And there is an increased risk for rapid metabolism. There is one more thing for the sake of completion, I have included this slide. This factors can be great more. If it is too much for you, just forget about this slide. But I will just uh, mention it for the sake of completion. If you have identified smoking and diabetes in your patients, there is no smoking. You don't have to change the original way of the patients smokes 10 up to 10 cigarettes. If the base original grade is A, based on the percentage models divided by age, we do an application for A just because the patient smokes. The patient smokes more than 10 cigarettes straight away can assign the grade C. So it is a dose dependent uh, reflection on the risk that the smoking poses. Similarly, it's diabetes. Any patient without diabetes, you don't have to change the grade. Any patient whom in whom it is less than 7 percentage, they are graded to grade B. If the original grade is A, if the original grade is B, you don't have to say. And if the original grade is anything less than C, and the patient has an SPA1C value, which is more than 7, a poorly controlled diabetes, we can directly assign Now to the last part, there is a diagnosis of the uh, diabetes given in a statement. This one has diagnosed the statement. So all, in your, all your answers, all in your cases, you should be writing this as the last statement. Diagnostic statement or professional diagnosis statement, it goes like this. You have to identify first, whether it is health or whether it is pelotitis. If you have identified pelotitis from the radiograph, from the charts, then you have to write the diagnosis statement. Write it as pelotitis, then you mention the next step, then you mention the grade, 
Then she mentioned the sorry stage, grade, current status, and this one. And before uh, concluding that this product you have to explore the differential diagnosis of the lung. That means any reason that can lead to bone loss, but that is not due to a product like I mentioned in the uh, initial uh, slides, any reason like uh, um, uh, uh, impaction of a thermola resulting in uh, a bone loss on the distal seven or endodontic periodontal lesion which is draining through healthy surface and causing bone loss from the retrograde aspect, this, this is not a uh, orthograde blocking this information. You cannot diagnose it as periodontic, but it's at the diagnosis endodontic periodontal lesion. Similarly, any trauma or fracture of the tooth, vertical root fractures. That can also lead to some amount of uh, clinical uh, distress on the bone as well as the Now coming to the, the most important or uh, the highlight of the presentation, that six simple steps in diagnosis of diagnosis. So once you have the, the your records ready, the radiograph, the charts, and diagnose the diagnosis, that's the next Six simple steps are like this. Step one, from the radiographs, you identify the disease. Make sure it is periodontal. The bone loss is due to periodontal. And exclude a non periodontal loss of bone loss. Once you have gone, uh, reach that, go to the next step. Assess the disease extent. From the radiogram, see whether bone loss is involving the entire uh, teeth or it is less than 30 percent. Or is it, if it is only involving the molars and incisors. If it is less than 30 percent, put it as localized. If it is more than 30 percent of the teeth affected, not sites, more than 30% of the teeth are involved with bone loss, diagnosis as generalized. Only the molars and the incisors of the molars alone are involved to diagnose this molar incisor pattern. Now, the third step is staging. Again, from the radiograph, identify the maximum bone loss, the worst sign. Estimate the percentage of bone loss in relation to the rope length. If it is reaching uh, in the coronal third less than 15%, stage it as stage 1, mild. If it is raising the entire coronal third, stage it as stage two, uh, stage two. If it is the of the middle third, it is stage three or my, uh, uh, severe. Or if it is raising up to the apex, as you see in this radiograph, it is stage four or three. Now the fourth step is once you have this worst cycle uh, for which you have used to stage the disease, you take the percentage of bonds. To me, this patient is having 80 percent of bone loss, and I try to divide it by the patient's age. The patient's age is 30. I divide 80 by 30. I get a value more than one. So straight away, I put it as minutes. Or in other words, if the percentage of bone loss is less than half the patient's age, all of you don't know that the medicine can apply in the practice. If it's less than half the patient's age to assign this It is more than the patient's age, put it as age C. All other categories create most of the patients before. Now the fifth step that is assigning the current status, looking at the pocket charts, EPD and DOP, depending upon the pockets and the building of pocket size, to assign a stable condition or answer. And the sixth step is the risk factor for five. Those risk factors, especially smoking and diabetes, you know there are other important risk factors like diabetes, stress, uh, micronutrients, uh, osteoporosis, but they don't have strong evidence base to say that they are risk factors. We only have evidence for smoking and diabetes at the moment. Future it will change, then it may not be a possible Right now, only two factors, smoking and diabetes. And also we include the previous smokers. If the patient has stopped smoking 10 years before, still in group. As a farmer's and if possible, try to determine the number of cigarettes. And also the diabetes, and try to know the space here and see Now, the, all the six steps put in together in a single slide. Step one, from the radiograph, know whether it is periodontitis. Step two, from the radiograph again, state whether the extent is more than 30 percent or less than 30 percent. Stage three, again from the radiograph, look at the worst side, assign the percentage of bone loss, say whether it is 1, 2, 3 or stage 4, then look at the same words aside and divide the percentage of bone loss by the patient's age and say whether it is grade A, B or C and 
then look at the current status look at the public pocket terms look at the breeding sites how many sites are breeding what is the range of pocket term if it is more than 4 mm and 5 mm or 6 mm or 7 mm and that is there is breeding for the 10 plus less sites or even the 5 mm pocket is breeding then our asset is currently unstable and then we have to construct a profile and another thing is that when you look at this the first four steps of the diagnosis of the problem can be made from the test that is the duty of this simplified version you just need a radiograph for till the stage four till the step four and further we have the pocket charts and we have the history that is medical history and the social history and the patient and the patient Now we'll see a few clinical case examples. So we will try to implement what we have uh, seen today in our patients. Look at this. All these are part of a series of uh, cases uh, uh, published by the journal. This is case one. This case one is for photographed the patient uh, who is a uh, 55 year old male patient. Looking at the photograph, we can say that there are there is underlying possession. Many such sites are there. You can say that the patient is having pelvitis, otherwise you can see this pelvic processing sites. And the history says that the patient is medically fit and well. The patient smokes around uh, 10 cigarettes per day, and he gives a previous history of pelvic pain. He is a regular gambler, and he uh, uh, gives a uh, the pocket chart so that the pockets are right from top to bottom, and building one from the bottom. Sites. Those who want to note it down, you have a uh, writing pad, and then you can note down the important points. And note down the age of the patient. Look at the medical history; it is medically normal, but he smokes around ten cigarettes, and there is a pocket ranging from four to nine millimeter, and there are more than ten percent of sites. When you look at the pocket chart again, you, uh, we we. Uh, Uh, you see that there are plenty of uh, sites which are very particular. The many sites, the molar region, there is one uh, one five region that showing the maximum pocket of here. Then we take the radiographs. Radiographs. When we take the radiographs, we have to take appropriate radiographs based on the pocket charts. Because only when you do the screening initially, the pockets are ranging at three to four millimeters. We can uh, take only five. But the pocket depths are more than five seven. We feel that it's losing the pocket depths. We want to study the apex zones. In such situation, we take the gold standard level of pelvic diagnosis, that is intraoral. And if you feel that the patient is having very mild disease, only one or two sites are affected with the pelvic depths, you can take an OPG and supplement it with selective IOPGs in the regions that we are. So when we look at this uh, radiogram, to me the worst side. I when I scanned the entire uh, patient's radiogram, the sides, I found that the, the worst side, the maximum bone loss is one fifth region, and the bone has bone loss has reached up to the apical one third. So when it has reached the apical one third, we assign it the worst side, and our staining and grading criteria will begin from this side. Let me see the we take the six steps to diagnose periodontitis. Step one, of course, it is periodontitis. There is plenty of evidence for bone loss in this patient with periodontitis. Step two, it is just, of course, it is generalized. There are more than thirty percent sites. Step three, we have identified the worst site, and the worst site bone loss is exactly periodontitis. It's stage four. And when you look at the patient, great, he is a forty-five-year-old patient. Eighty percent is bone loss in a forty-five-year-old patient. It is more than one, or it is more than the patient's age. The percentage of bone loss is more than the patient's age. I don't need a calculator to that to assign it. I can straight away say that it's crazy. And when I look at the pocket charts and the breeding of pocket, I know that there are four to eight millimeter pockets. There are pockets which are deeper than five millimeter. There are plenty of sites that are breeding. There are more than ten percent of sites that breeds. That shows the patient's age unstable. And patient gives a risk factor of smoking that is included in the risk factor of five. So the diagnosis, treatment for this patient will be 
periodontitis is generalized or generalized periodontitis. You can try both of this. Periodontitis is generalized or generalized periodontitis. Then you have to try that. So this is extent, then the stage, then the grade, then the current disease status, and the risk factor. We take another case from part of the uh, case series that are presented in the case. Two siblings, girls, persons with periodontitis. Actually, it is a first girl, the elder one, 19 year old female, who is otherwise healthy, reported with bleeding gums and spacing in the front. Then the pocket chart was uh, done, a six point pocket chart was done. And there was it was found to be generalized pocketing in the range of four to seven millimeter. Uh, there is a grade two percussion in the upper first molar. You can see there is mesial percussion similar in the upper first molar. Uh, then in the bleeding and probing, there are plenty of size, more than 30 percent, up to 30 percent size bleeding. And of course, the pockets are more than four to So if you have a pen and paper or if you have the memory is strong, you note these points down. The patient is 19 year old, generalized pocketing in the range of 4 to 7 millimeters, bleeding and probing more than 30 percentage, and many pockets more than 4 millimeters on the Then you take the radiographs. In the radiographs, you can see that. You look for the worst side. In this patient, the worst side is the 1615 region. 1516 region, the bone loss has reached up to you can assign that. See, when you look at the premolar or even the first molar, you can say that up to 60% of the road is exposed. 60%. So, what will be the diagnosis? What will be the stage? Or what will be the diagnostic statement? The patient is 19 years old. Since she has got generalized bone marks, more than 30% of the teeth are involved. The diagnosis is generalized perilonite. The worst side, the bone loss has extended to the middle third of the bone. So we assign it as stage 3. When we divide it with the patient's age, 60 divided by 19, it is more than 1, more than the patient's age. So it's very easy to put her under grades. And since there are many plenty of things, it is very sensible because the patient is already 19. The 19 year old patient person is generally small loss. And bone loss up to the middle of uh, the field gene that shows that the person is having the rapid progression of the This is a very similar thing. You see that this is, it is important to communicate with the patient and the system is as progress. It is important for medical legal purposes to document that the patient is having severe prolongitis. It shows the importance of active treatment, the importance of treating this case aggressively because the patient is having now we take, since the patient gave a history that uh, a 19 year old female patient has got generalized periodontal disease. We imagine the previous classification, what is the diagnosis we should have given for that, that patient? We should have given generalized aggressive periodontal disease. Now, when you, when you diagnose generalized aggressive periodontal disease in one sibling, we will always ask for family history of periodontal disease. So, uh, they have uh, entered about the siblings and she told that I have a younger sister and that patient was also called for examination. The younger sister was only 14 year old, mm -hmm. just having good general health. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, when charts were taken, charts showed that the pockets range from 4 to 7 millimeter. Uh, there were uh, pocketing in the upper uh, right molar and the premolar regions, also in the low, uh, lower left incisors. I'm reading on probing uh, percentage of sites is more than 25 percentage and no patients involved. Since the patient is having only a uh, few sites of attachment does and bone loss, we didn't go for, go for a, they didn't go for a uh, full mouth intra or a survey, but instead they have gone for an OPG and they selected IOPs in the uh, affected sites. So this is the worst site. Uh, that is the 1615 region of this patient. Uh, where uh, the uh, percentage of bone loss is something, the bone loss has reached up to the, uh, the coronal 
it has reached only the entire coronal curve of the sun. It has not progressed to the middle. So when it, the, it is coronal curve, it is up to 33 percent of all loss. We call it as stage two. And if you divide the 33 by the patient's age, that is 40, you can say that it is more than one for the ladies. Rapid progression. And since the, there are bleeding called for throbbing sites, more than 10 percent of them, it is diagnosed as stage two. Since the patient had, uh, this didn't have any risk factors, maybe only the genetic factor was there, but the genetic factor, factor at present, at the moment, is not measurable. We cannot think of diagnosis. So, no risk factors. Moving to the fourth case, another patient, 15 year old female. Patient after successful pelvic pain. Patient is under SP from some other uh, clinician. Patient has moved to a new location. So she has come to see uh, the local uh, pelvis. She was treated successfully by some other pelvis, some other mistake. She is following the uh, SPT which is uh, in a meticulous manner. She is an ex smoker. She stopped uh, smoking 12 years back. Look at the uh, photographs, you find clinical health of There are no sites of inflammation. Of course, there are uh, interproximal uh, recessions that shows the past disease experience, uh, both in the anterior and posterior cases. Now, when you look at the pocket charts in that patient, uh, you find that the pockets are only in the length of 3 to 4 millimeters. And the bleeding probing sites are only very few sites, less than 3% of the sites are bleeding. And there are no 4 millimeter sites. Only there are a few 4 millimeter sites, and those 4 millimeter sites are not shown. So we again took the radiograph, uh, full mouth radiograph since this is an analyzed case. We take a full mouth radiograph and assess uh, the situation. But in the box, we have the important uh, findings in the box. Now, this is the worst side in this patient, upper and left uh, posterior. We try to assess the percentage of bone loss. There's an infra body defect and it is uh, going to the uh, going, uh, till the root apex, so it is apical one third, so it is age four, and since the patient's age, so you can say that there is more than 70 to 70 percent bone loss, the patient age is probably 45 or in the 40s, who is having 70 percent bone loss, the bone loss is more than the patient's age, it is grade C, and since there are bleeding sites less than 10 percent, and no bleeding in four millimeters sites, the patient can because that is the problem that is only treated for me. Any 4 millimeter pocket up in a treated periodontitis case is considered stable and side is not stable. And risk factors, even those patients that stop smoking 12 years back, is still taken in the uh, risk factor for 5 years. For us, uh, smoking is an important factor as it's, uh, it affects lingering in the patient throughout the years of the past 6 months. Now, moving to the next case, case 5, 47 year old female, again, a non smoker. This is the clinical photographs, essential clinical photograph. Each post uh, should, 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 should be document cases like this. You should take a mantle view of the upper, you should take a crucial uh, view of the lower, you should take a frontal view, and you should take two separate right and left views to the patient. So, altogether, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, five photographs in the entire the picture of the system. Now, uh, when we do the charting, we found that there are four to six millimeter sites are there, uh, especially in the 1, 5, 1, 6, and 2, 6 region. Bleeding and probing is 20 percentage, and the radiographs were uh, taken, and uh, the worst site, which was the uh, upper left. Uh, all are mistaken and shows that the worst side is 2 6, distal aspect of 2 6 of the worst side. And see from this chart that 2 6 uh, distal is a 6 of the bone loss. Because the bone loss is also corresponding to the pocket. So, this is the worst side. So, uh, we try to uh, assess the uh, extent of bone loss with relation to the, uh, the root length. So that there is 30% bone loss 
I think it is still in the corona so our classification uh, staging will be stage two. And grave will be the patient when you consider the patient's age. If you remember patient is 47 year old female and if you take, take the patient's age, 47 divided by 30 is between mm -hmm. 0.5 to the 1. So it is grade B or moderate rate of promotion. This is sensible. Forty seven year old patient who shows the thirty percent of the in one side. You can say that. This is not as strong. It is more. If it is forty percent age or it is fifty percent age, in a forty seven year old patient you would have stayed stay in the same city. This is sensible. Then we move on to the last last uh, case in age 6, again 37 year old female patient. Please not the age of the patient here yeah, because it is pretty in this case. 37 year old female patient, breeding down since one year, she is reporting good general health and never smoker. She gives her family to get along like this. Medical uh, picture looks uh, very good. Uh, uh, when you take the local, uh, do the chart, we found that there are certain deep pockets. One six region, there are some deep pockets. Similarly, there are some deep pockets in the three six region. And the ranging it ranges from four to seven millimeter. You have a seven pocket here on the distal aspect of one six, and you have another seven millimeter pocket here on the distal aspect of three six. Uh, and there are breeding on both sides also. Now, uh, when the radiograph was taken, uh, because only there are two sides, actually two or three sides with the uh, uh, PPD and bone loss. We took selective IOP. They have to take a selective IOP as for this patient and uh, 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 panoramic radiograph. Uh, from the panoramic radiograph, uh, the bone loss is not generalized. Just that the sites are involved. Uh, it is mainly affecting the 1 6 and the 3 6. Uh, so, selective IOP is uh, taken and what you have seen is here that. Bone loss that here has gone. Bone loss here has gone uh, to the uh, middle third. This is the worst affected site in the patient, the basal aspect of uh, 3 6, where the pocket is 7 millimeters. The bone loss has reached up to the middle third, so the stage is pretty severe. And the gray is C because when you divide the patient's case by the bone loss, it's fast progression. But the extent is not the appearance because if the bone loss has involved only the molars. No pyvalor was involved. Only the molars are involved in bone loss. When you have bone loss or attachment loss involving only the molars, if no other teeth involved, or if the incisors are also involved, you have to assume this molar Even though the patient is 37, the other patient is 30, in the 30s. This is something about uh, something around 50% of the bone loss in this patient. Uh, even though the patient is in her 30s, we still diagnose it as a molar excess of macrohyta according to the new classification criteria. Because what it says is that the bone loss or the attachment that loss has to be limited to the molars or the ins and the incisors. Uh, in such case, irrespective of the patient's age, we diagnose it as a molar excess of macrohyta. And since the pockets are more than say uh, 5 millimeter, and there are plenty of breeding sites, it is uh, diagnosed as a If you remember the previous 1999 classification, when we diagnosed localized aggressive development, in this case, what it takes for localized aggressive development. But in localized aggressive development, we never had a subclassification like severe or moderate uh, or But in the new classification, even if you are saying the molar excessive, should not stop with that. Should again go on, go on to stage the disease and grade the disease and stay with the current times. So that's the end of uh, session one. I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, there are limitations in an online only platform. I think that should have been done as a workshop, but the prevailing situation doesn't allow us to do this. So I uh, know, uh, thank you for your patient listening. Uh, this is the end. Of session one and over to Dr. Baiju. Dr. Baiju. Dr. Baiju.
okay. Thank you for the exhaustive presentation of the part one of the session one of the presentation on gingival gingivitis diagnosis of pedron disease and excellent clinical examples that were presented here. Now, before proceeding, I would like to tell that we had provision only to admit 250 participants. So almost 50 people had to be refused entry. I sincerely apologize for those who could not be admitted today. But with the permission of the speaker, we will record it and uh, put it on YouTube. So those who could not get a chance to attend today will be able to attend it later. So sorry about that. People who had to be left out because they will cross the upper limit of 250. Now, we we'll just, uh, the, some of the questions are there in the chat box. Which way, sir, can raise up. How will you calculate the percentage of bone loss? That's one, one question that has been asked. Would you, would you like to answer to that, uh, Baiju? Sure, sir. So I think uh, if you uh, yes. go through the presentation, when you get a chance to see the YouTube uh, video, yes. go through the presentation, you can see that I have put some yellow lines on the radiographs. So first, when you get a radiograph, when you get a radiograph of the patient, to identify the most affected site from the radiograph. Once you uh, 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 detect the most affected site, you divide the root length into different parts, coronal, middle, apical. You don't have to do it by drawing lines on the radiograph, but initially you may have to do it. But once you become experienced, or an experienced clinician, it will be very easy to identify the extent of bone loss depending upon, in relation to the root because it's a clinical judgment. And then you say that if the it is one third of the root, so the root is 100 percent, one third of the root is 33 percent. So 33 plus 33 plus 33 is 99 percent. So 33 percent of the bone loss is there. If the entire corona third is there. If you just reach uh, middle third, you can say that it is something around 50 to 60 percent or 40 to 60 percent depending upon the extent of involvement. The entire middle third is involved, you can say that we have uh, reached uh, something around 70 percent. So if the bone loss is in the apex, the bigger region, you can say that definitely the bone loss is more than 70 percent. And then you see the patient's age and then you divide the percentage bone loss that you have assigned to that radiograph. You divide it by the patient's age that will be good. There is one more question on what are the merits and demerits of the new classification. I think probably you'll be uh, touching on it towards the end of your program. Uh, so, sir, I have initially uh, mentioned yeah, you have about we, it. We, yeah, we are not in a position to say that the old classification is poor. Actually, it should be, uh, it should be, uh, it's not be, it not be uh, very cruel if you say that the old classification is poor. But since there is a lot of development that has happened in the last few years, in our understanding of the lung disease, we now, uh, we now follow up disease of better techniques thanks to the new research evidence. And, uh, for example, the 4 millimeter criteria that we have now, uh, which doesn't play, is considered as a new normal uh, in metric of the lung disease. So since you have a new, new evidence uh, coming up, uh, thanks to the systematic evidence and the stringent uh, randomized control trials, we as a society has responded to the change in development. And we have come out with an update of this. So this classification, the merits are, we are, we are moving towards personalized periodontics. We are specifically diagnosing uh, the grade and stage of the, the disease in that particular patient, rather than giving a broad classification uh, like a periodontitis or chronic periodontitis, aggressive periodontitis. We are specifically mentioning at which stage the patient's disease is. is what is the future susceptibility of this patient? Whether that patient's disease is currently stable or unstable. And, 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 and to top it all, we now have the criteria for gingival pain. So these are the two important uh, aspects uh, of the new classification. Uh, I think all the seniors will agree with me this aspect. Yes. There is one more question. After successful peron treatment in on some follow-up visits, can you call the patient's condition as currently stable with a reduced peridontium? I think that's been addressed in the presentation. Yes. Uh, when we have a patient 
as periodontist, it's our duty to specifically say that whether the patient is having periodontitis or not. Reduce periodontal means it can be due to periodontitis or it can be due to non periodontitis process, like a position or infection. So it's very important to state it as if it is due to periodontitis, it's due to crack induced inflammation. State it as periodontitis. Once a periodontitis patient, always a periodontitis. Once a patient is diagnosed with periodontitis, even if he or she is treated successfully, he or she is still a periodontitis patient. Of course, with a reduced periodontitis. The better term will be a periodontitis patient. The reduction of the periodontitis is due to periodontitis. But when you look at the current stability, the there are uh, pockets which are less than 4 millimeters and the bleeding is less than 10 percentage and there are no bleeding in 4 millimeter sites. You can say that it's a patient, periodontitis patient, stage, grade, whatever it is applicable to that patient and current bleach state. That should be the diagnosis. Current bleach state. Yes. Now, Professor Sheila from Mysore has asked a question. Bleeding in spokers is usually not visible, so it might be difficult to assess it. First of all, thank you, uh, Madam, for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, we have to relate on the uh, history. The patient says that uh, it is not a smoker. Of course, as I uh, claim the permission, we can identify whether he's a smoker or not. And we assume that patients are honest to us. They are uh, not disclosing certain facts to us. But as far as possible, if you can uh, diagnose, uh, you can uh, detect that the patient has a smoking history, always be very And uh, it, it won't be uh, difficult for us to assign, especially if the patient is a heavy smoker. Maybe uh, if the patient is an occasional smoker, they are not disclosing it. We have to tell them, we have to tell that patients that Smoking and diabetes are two important factors. When we communicate with the patient, when we counsel our patients, it's very important to talk to the patients that these are the two risk factors that are to be taken care of. Even if I am doing the treatment, the periodontist does 20% of the treatment, 80% of the treatment, uh, the, the treatment or, the, or the care is given by the patient. So we have to educate our patients that success of the treatment depends upon the 80% that Oh, by you, two more questions. By the one is, does the new classification bring about any change in the current treatment protocol? Absolutely not. There is no uh, change in the uh, treatment yes. protocol. Actually, it is reflecting what we are doing. The new classification reflects how we work up our patients, how we treat our patients, and how we follow up our patients. It is a, uh, it's a, it's a mirror image of what we are actually doing. Uh, now the last question, Baiju. Uh, it is, can we come to a conclusion about pristine DJV just by uh, uh, observation? Doesn't it get a histological confirmation? And second part of the question is, uh, just by considering the severely affected tooth, is it uh, right to do the staging based on the most severely affected tooth? And the third part of the yes. yes. repeat, repeat, repeat the second part and the third part. Just by considering the most severely affected tooth, we are talking about the staging now. Is it right to talk about staging just by considering the most severely affected tooth? That is the question. Third part, sir. Third part is grading, such as the bone loss over the past five years. Can we, come Can we come to a conclusion when the patient is addressing for the first time, we are seeing the patient for the first time on that occasion, how we can predict about the amount of bone loss and how how it has occurred? Yes, I understand. I will take the first part first. The question in the is a theoretical question. Uh, question means, uh, as I told you, normality in medicine means 95%. If you take hemoglobin values, normally it's 12 to 14 percent. That means if you take 100 people, 95 people, normal people will have hemoglobin that is of 12 percent. But there are these few exceptions. Similarly, if you take clinical health, clinical visual health, 95 of the percentage of the patients will have some amount of sites or blood sites in the patient. 
we have to accept that. So that is why the new classification we have, and we consider it as we consider it as, as uh, a clinically normal view of the ten percent. We are accepting that fact. Now. There will be a few brain sites in that case. Pristine injury means there is absolutely no bleeding and no um, infiltrate, intramatic infiltrate. You cannot take a biopsy in a patient uh, to diagnose the virus. It's not ethical, it is not needed. So we have to do an array of the clinical concerns. So pristine gingiva, uh, what, why I have shown is that that, that concept exists. There are very rare situations where you can find perfectly healthy gingiva. And if you take a biopsy and you see there will be no implementation. But that should be the way to diagnose uh, the visual health. Second part of the question, uh, if we take only the worst side in a patient and assign the stage, is it right? Now what we have done is, till now many of us have not uh, started to implement the, the new classification in the clinical practice. Why? Because it appears complicated. When you look at the AAP criteria, for assigning stage they are taking too many, multiple criteria. They are using CL, bleeding, sorry, bleeding and probing, pocket depth, percentage of loss, and many other factors. But what, what uh, the IEBSP has done in their implementation is like that. They have taken only the percentage of loss. So this is a stepping stone for the new classification. Once you are thorough with the new classification, once you are thorough with assigning stages and grades, based on this simplistic criteria, as you gain experience, as you know better the classification, you can include other parameters that are there in the classification. That is the answer to the second question. The answer to the third question, grading based on the past disease uh, experience, that is why I told you, in a country like India, I feel that the simplistic BSP implementation criteria is more applicable, more practical in that we are using only the radiographic evidence of the worst site to classify disease and uh, uh, we are assigning grades to. It is not, uh, you cannot say that, or you should not insist that all your patients should be bringing the previous five days records with them. Especially when you see the patient for the first time. If you take a radiogram of the patient uh, of the worst site, you can assign a grade to that patient. No need for you to use records. I think this is a stepping stone. All of you should know that this is a stepping stone. Once we are confident in the uh, that we can uh, routinely do this in our clinics, then we can uh, add on the additional criteria that is going to work. I give one last question regarding this. Why the classification has not yet linked the biochemical and microbial tests? Because there is always a chance that the microbes are still invading the tissues and blood system but not showing any clinical symptoms. There is no evidence. The, the, the beauty of the new classification is that all of these classific all these new classification has been uh, brought out based on 19 commission systems. They have exhaustively reviewed the, the existing evidence regarding all this. That is why they have not only included smoking and habits in the risk factors. Even though when we write an essay on all risk factors, we will enumerate 10, 12 uh, uh, criteria or 10, 12 factors as risk factors. But we have, right now we have only evidence, uh, only the co-worker evidence only regarding smoking and habits. Similarly, um, uh, for, for uh, biomarkers, right now we don't have any biomarker to diagnose the we are in the developing stage. Maybe in the future, we may come up with uh, some biomarker. In the AAP, they have mentioned about CRP, but that is not inclusive. CRP is a uh, non-specific biomarker. That is why I didn't mention it here. CRP is a non-specific biomarker. We cannot rely on CRP to diagnose the lung diabetes. We have better clinical methods to diagnose the lung diabetes. So right now, this classification has taken only existing strong evidence base. Okay, by you we can continue with the second part. For the information of the delegate, there is a small second session on endopathic lesions and gingival recession, which is a much smaller part of it. Okay, by you will be making the presentation on that right now. And after that, sir, after that, if you want, we can do a session on that uh, second part also. Yes, we can continue. Continue, by you. Well, th thanks for watching the session one. Now we move on to the second session. Uh, Today, if you notice, I have included basically four uh, diseases and conditions. Only four diseases and conditions 
have been discussed in detail in this first place. Two are all individual health, individual health, and health. Because that is what we see routinely in our patients. The next two things that we routinely see in our patients are individual health and health. So, uh, if you uh, begin with applying the new classification in these four areas, it will be a huge beginning for that. As you uh, gain experience and I, I, I gain confidence in the new classification, we can read more and implement the, uh, other uh, criteria also. Now, the, the, there is a total overhaul of the new classification of expression. It's a whole workshop. They have considered the Kairos classification as a standard. So, until now, we have been uh, you know, considering this classification. You know, there are uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic classification, it's a fantastic one. Uh, we have been uh, analyzing our patients based on the previous classification. But if we do understand that, there are certain regulations in the And this is a recent one, Kairos uh, classification 2011, where he has, uh, they have been uh, categorized process into RT1, RT2, and RT2. What is recession type 1 or RT1 according to the new classification based on the Kairos uh, paper? And this is uh, the new classification RT1 means you have attachment loss without, sorry, you have injury recession without interfunctional attachment. You have injury recession, that means you have attachment loss on the variable side, but there is no affection of the interfunctional side. So this includes, we are not considering whether the recession has extended to the pupillary infection or not. So that is why you can include both millers class 1 and class 2. That means there is buccal recession or even lingual recession that, uh, but without any associated CDAL. So the criteria for recession classification is considering the interproximate. CNA. In Miller's, it was considering in the approximate bond loss or soft shooters. It was not specific for CNA. Either bond loss or soft shooters. So there was some imprecision in the Miller's classification. Also, the, uh, whether it is presented with the correlation or not. So as you can see, this this is the Miller's class 2, which is the recession has extended to the Miller's class. There is no attachment here. Right but there is no interproximal test number of In this photo, there is a buckle position, but it does not reach up to the table into the junction. So both these categories will fall into. Now RP2 is individual position with interproximal attachment. We recognize that there is attachment loss. So there is some overlapping with the Miller's class 3. In Miller's class 3, we say that Buccal recession should have extended to the mucosal junction plus some additional interproximal. Like you see here, uh, there is some interproximal attachment loss. You can see that there is uh, some interproximal process on the part of the visceral aspect of the slide. And as, of course, there is a recession in this one. So, RP2 means there is interproximal. Now RP3 is the interproximal, or in, in other words, if you look at the RP2, once again, you can say that even though there is interproximal attachment now, it has not reached up to the buccal So RP2 recognizes interproximal loss, but it has not progressed to the level of the buccal Now when you look at the uh, recession type 3, it says that. The interproximal attachment loss actually exceeds that of the buccal attachment. So there are some problems in the this class. These are the three recession types for the classification RP1, RP2, and RP3. That is a gingival side assessment. You always have to do the two such assessments. 
as part of the new classification. Group size type we consider two factors. That means class A or class B. It's nothing but your ability to detect the CEG. You can detect the CEG as you see in this patient. You can detect the CEG in the recession side. It's class A. You cannot detect the CEG as in this uh, infographic. It's class A. If step means there is a step deformity on the road that is exposed to the There is a sense of a step deformity. You add a plus two, step plus. That step, in essentially, there are four categories. Uh, if you consider the two side of the road surface dimension, that means class A minor. Means the recession is associated with the CJ that is detectable, the CJ, CJ that is visible is visible, and there is no step deformity. A plus means that you can detect the CJ and there is a defect on the road surface that is why it is plus. B means you cannot detect, you cannot detect the CJ, that is why it is class B. And minus means there is no step defect. B plus means CJ is not visible. Also, there is a step This is all about the news classification. And uh, they have uh, provided a beautiful table in that paper which discusses about the answers. This is a table that they have given. This is an essential documentation for the Who are embarking on the roof coverage side. Now, that talks about the visual side, that talks about the roof side, that talks about the recession types, RT1, RT2, RT3. You can measure the depth in millimeters here. You can measure the gingival thickness. That's an important thing, biotype. You can measure the gingival thickness here. You can measure the keratinized tissue width. Here, if it is present or if it is absent, it can not be there. Then you state whether the CG is visible, if it is A, not visible, then it will be, and whether the step reform is possible, it is possible, and so it is happening. So that sums up about, about the dual uh, possession classification, going to the dual certain classification. Uh, it has been a total overhaul of the uh, classification that, that we have now. Now we'll move on to the another important uh, clinical situation. Now when we see a radiograph like this, what we notice is that there is a deep extending the uh, road complex, especially in the location. There will be a deep buckle, a mid buckle deep pocket in this patient. And when you look at the two, you can say that there's a poor road canal uh, for the patient, but there is some uh, Non-vital, periodically treated with, a, with some evidence of perforation. There is perforation involvement. There is a deep isolated pocket. I repeat, deep isolated pocket associated with the, the tooth. When you scan the other sides, it is not affected. Other sides are not affected. So definitely, you can say that the patient is having some interpretation. And there can be other instances where there are no restrictions. No restriction to tooth. There are no fibers in it because the tooth is not Actually, there will not be any fibers in it. But there is some exudation coming from the surface. The patient has come for some other purpose. The patient is not having a complaint. But when you examine, you find that some pus is coming out from the surface on the distal aspect of the face. Tooth which has lost its, its crown. But when you look at the radiograph carefully, you can see that the calcification in the root canals, the root canals are obliterated. 
And when you do that, then it's only get success if you have to uh, uh, diagnose with, with other chemical methods. And I briefly mention about the new classification, the endocrinations category. It says that there are two types of endocrinations. One with the root damage. One with the root damage. So first we have to identify any evidence of root damage. What do you mean by root damage? There is a crack or a fracture, any vertical bone with any purple uh, root canal or pulp chamber perforation either caused by caries or caused iatrogenically by the dentist by performing the restoration or is there any evidence of external resolution? so you can know this either by clinical means sometimes you need radiographs sometimes you need transnumination to find out uh, cracks and sometimes you need even CTCT especially if you want to diagnose the options especially if you so, so, depending upon the situation, you go in for investigations to find out any road damage. If you three, if you find any of the three uh, conditions uh, responsible for the road damage, then the diagnosis can be done. Bracket, you can mention what was the damage. If you don't get any signs or any evidence of the root damage, and then still you have an endocrinology, then you diagnose it as the endocrinology. Without root damage, again, it is subclassified. Endocrinology in a periodontal situation. So look elsewhere in the mouth. There is evidence of periodontal from the radiographs or pocket charts. And elsewhere in the mouth, there is evidence of periodontal. Then you mention that if you scan the other other parts of the uh, rendition and find there is no evidence of the there is no confidence or attachment of the rest of the mouth, then you can do the classification of the And once you diagnose these two, these two can be again uh, subclassified. Extent of the nerve. Great means one means is a narrow, deep pocket that is extended to the two surfaces. Great two means a wide, deep, deep pocket in one two surface. And great three means a deep pocket in more than one two surface. So the grading is similar for the two, uh, two categories. So essentially, when you get a, a patient with an isolated site of deep periodontal pocket going to the apex of the tooth, and the tooth is showing uh, no response in pulp testing uh, uh, or an altered response in pulp testing or the radiogram shows that the tooth is root canal treated or you find any evidence of crack, crack or pulp, 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 uh, uh, perforation that we can assign the diagnosis of endothelation and based on whether there is root damage or not you say it is associated with the root damage and based on whether periodontal is present in the or not, the diagnosis in a periodontal situation. So, we take, uh, uh, when you see such a patient, uh, you try to assign uh, the grade. So this is a uh, patient, when you, get, when you get such a condition and there is a uh, restoration is lost, restoration is lost, uh, there is no evidence of both canal treatment, suddenly you should go in for a sensitive. Can do a cold test and based on the results to come to the diagnosis. So I, uh, this is an important clinical case I'm going to show you. But this is uh, uh, very important in two aspects. I'll explain it. Uh, now look at this case. Uh, now we again we we'll go back to the diagnosis of So when we get a full mouth uh, radiographic uh, charts and a full mouth periodontal chart. Uh, we go by the six steps. First, we say whether it is periodontitis, which is step two is extend, it is generalized. Step two is stage. We identify the worst site. This is the worst site, one six. When you identify this site, when you closely examine this site, you find that it's an endodontic. It's an endodontic. So maybe deep pocket as 
here. On further uh, clinical examination, it was found that there was the vertical and the tooth for example. But this is the worst side. So can you consider this site to stage and uh, create your diabetes? The answer is no, because this is a different diagnosis. This is a diagnosis of endodontic endodontic tissue because the deep pocket is associated with the So your diagnosis will be endodontic endodontic tissue. Uh, sorry, not road damage because there was a uh, periodic patient, there was an endodontic periodic patient because it is associated with one way to two. It is given greatly because it is a white and Now, since the worst site is diagnosed with endodontic patient, now we have to take the next to worst site to stay in. So, this is the next to worst site to stay in. That shows that. Then again, we will uh, put the grids to get the that one on that one is extending to the middle. So, we will assign a classification very severe in this case. That is how the diagnosis works. So, the important aspect is that when you identify the worst site, you have to exclude non periodontic reasons for our attachment. That is the first thing. So, if the worst site is having an endocrine lesion, or if the worst site is associated with an impacted third product, you, you uh, reckon that that is a reason for the attachment loss, then you should not consider that site and select some other site which is the worst site for the diagnosis of periodontitis. But when you write a periodontitis a diagnosis statement, we include both. We include that patient with generalized severe periodontitis, great such and such, great such and such. Then you write second endodontic periodontal lesion and the diagnosis of the classification or category of the endodontic So, what is the diagnosis according to the new classification in this page? Diagnosis endodontic periodontic with root damage because the patient had a perforation. And it is grade one because it was a deep, narrow pocket working only the Here, there was no pocket. So, this was a grade one. Now, in this case, what is your diagnosis? As you see, uh, there is a deep pocket in more than one to seven. All the roads are in there. There are two sites with a um, deep, a wide pocket. So, the diagnosis is endodontic, periodontic dislation in a non periodontic dislation. Wide, deep pocket, or more than one to seven. Whereas, in the initial uh, case, which I have shown is a case of endodontic periodontic dysfunction in a periodontic dysfunction because the patient has periodontitis elsewhere. Um, but, uh, we are coming to the end of the presentation. I, at this juncture, I would like to thank profusely uh, the uh, ISP DK study group, especially Dr. Thomas sir. Uh, and all other senior teachers for so giving me an opportunity to uh, do a presentation like this. Um, and I thank all the viewers who have tuned in from different parts of the country for the patient listening. Uh, it was, uh, I know it was difficult to cross the two hour mark, and it was very difficult for you to uh, tune in uh, patient to listen to this. But I sincerely thank you. Dr. Baiju. Sir, sir. Uh, it was very well appreciated. I've got a lot of feedback. Each and every word what you talked has been imbibed. I'm sure this has been very informative for all the postgraduate students and the faculty who have attended. Just one or two more questions are there. Uh, first question is what is the follow up time of relation to determine the current treatment of the disease? Sir. And what, is the, what is the follow up time or the duration to determine the current status of the disease? The current status is determined uh, when you see the patient uh, for the first time. So, diagnosis of periodontitis, sir, once you, once you finish asking the question, can you please uh, mute yourself, sir? Yeah. Okay. So, the sir? Yes, I am muted. Hello? 
Can you, sir? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go on, go on. Sir, can you please uh, mute your phone, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm muted. I'm, I'm muted. Okay. Somebody else has joined uh, it. Okay. So, uh, the diagnosis of chondromalgia is made when you see the patient for the first time. At the initial presentation, you assign the current status. But each time, when the patient comes back for any follow-up after your treatment, each time you have to assign the current status because based on the current status only we decide how to proceed with the situation. Because we all know that paramedics cannot be cured, can only be treated, can only be controlled, can only be controlled. So when the patient comes back, the default uh, re uh, evaluation period is three months. If you do a non surgical therapy, you have to review the patient after three months. When you review the patient after three months, it is a right time to reassess the rock and roll. It's the right time to reassess the healing. So you should heal it. And when you do a probing, you should not do a repeat probing before three months. But you can always access the all healing status for the prior control after one month. But if you feel that the patient is not following properly for two months, uh, you can do that. But you should only do the assessment after three months. And each time when you reassess the patient, you have to do a stability assessment, a current death situation assessment. Raju, I think that is the only question remaining that I got the messages in that box saying that it was a very important research session, excellent presentation, etc. And we have all have input on the presentation. Raju, no more. Are you? Yeah, sir. Sir, uh, I am Anduma, and my photo cannot be seen. Okay, I don't want to show my face because, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> because of COVID. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, arrangement done by Baiju, and especially thank thanks to the, your uh, faculty as well as Baiju also. Baiju, very good presentation. Thank you, sir. It's it's it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an honor for me, sir, since uh, he's my teacher. To be introduced to this webinar itself is a very huge honor for me. Thank you for your advice, sir. Any, anybody else would like to say anything? Any other senior faculty, heads of the department? Anybody would like to say something? No, uh, uh, by you, not the conversation from here. Sir? Yeah. Uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Biju and uh, congratulate by you for having organized uh, today's webinar and Baiju, you have done justice for uh, the topic whatever has been given to you and uh, this topic is not only, for, not only for postgraduate point of view, even for we clinicians because we are in still, we are in the still early days of uh, 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 just what is that, uh, after the, uh, the classification has been introduced so we had uh, our own limitations in understanding the uh, the classification. So I think you have made it uh, very simple and uh, very informative. And let me yes, emphasize it to your Dr. Baiju. Thank you so yes, much, sir. sir. Same here, that Dr. Baiju. It was a very wonderful, exhaustive session, and you made the classification so simple and understanding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ranjana Madam. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Am I audible? For the information of the, all the delegates in the chat box, we put that feedback form, kindly fill it up. It won't take more than a minute. And according to that, we'll send you the attendance certificate based on the emails that we get. So please take a minute off. You have already spent more than two hours, two and a half hours listening. So I think you can spare a minute to fill up the uh, feedback form also. No, for by you, thank you so much that uh, you put in so much effort and made this presentation. It has been very informative and has been great benefit to all the clinicians, the faculty members, and the postgraduate students. And as I said, I am extremely sorry that we had to deny plans uh, to about 50 people to attend because we didn't expect so many people to be there. Across 250, we could accommodate only 250 people. So, if, if you give us permission, we can uh, uh, we'll put the recorded version on the YouTube, but that is exclusively up to the speaker to give his consent for the same. 
Absolutely, sir. No issues. Then I think it will be beneficial for those who couldn't log in today because of the lack of space. They will be able to listen to this later since Dr. Baiji has given his consent. We'll upload this presentation on YouTube for the benefit of others who could not listen. And for the information of all the members, we had login from almost all the states of India, that is from Bangalore, from Maharashtra, from Gujarat, Karnataka, from Delhi, there were people, we had people from Orissa, almost the whole of Kerala has logged in. In addition, we had delegates from Malaysia, uh, there were logins from Nepal and also from the Ajman University, UAE, we had presentation. So that shows to how famous and how an eminent person at Rishi, Dr. Baiju is, there was much more than what we expected the people have logged in. Thank you, Baiju. Anything more to say, otherwise we can disband this webinar? Anything more to say, otherwise we can disband this webinar? Baiju, would you like to say anything concluding? Sir, uh, extremely uh, thankful for the organizers for initiating for uh, ISP DK and for all the participants who uh, children from the different parts of the world, from, from the country and from abroad. Uh, thank you all. Uh, that's all. Okay. Thank you all the delegates for sparing your valuable time and being there till the end, almost two and a half hours we have been together. Thank you all. Now, as I said, please fill up the feedback form and we'll send you the certificate of presentation. Thank you all. Thank you.